Okay, so Sean, thank you for uh, taking the time to talk to me and the students at the University of Waterloo today. Uh, we're going to talk about particularly globalization and the impact that it uh, it has along with technology. But I thought I would start by just uh, by way of introducing you uh, by asking you to talk about uh, the challenges that are facing governments today. You've been an advisor to government in a number of areas. Uh, and I thought we'd really set the scene by saying, you know, apart from COVID-19, what, what are the main uh, issues that governments are facing today? Well, thanks for having me uh, uh, today to, to talk to you and the students about these issues. Um, they were important prior to the pandemic, and of course, they're even uh, heightened um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a consequence of the pandemic and the extent to which it's reshaping how we think about the role of government and markets, the way we think about international relations, the way we think about innovation and technology, and increasingly, of course, how we think about globalization itself. Um, and and so, you know, one of the things I have tried to do in my work um, that I, I sort of see is at the intersection between public policy and politics is to try to um, synthesize um, some of the ideas and research uh, occurring um, within the academy and elsewhere and to translate that um, to, to, to policymakers um, and, and in, in a sort of applied way. And, one of the issues, Peter, that I was um, focused on even prior to the pandemic, but uh, even more so uh, in, in, in recent weeks and months, is the extent to which a combination of the rise of intangible capital, um, so the shift from a goods producing economy to an economy increasingly rooted in intellectual property, software, and data, um, for instance, uh, a combination of that and the rising U.S. geopolitical U.S.-China geopolitical rivalry uh, is sort of fundamentally changing the basic underlying assumptions of uh, Canada's foreign economic policy, um, and the extent to which the these two separate yet inextricably linked forces uh, are going to require Canadian policymakers, Canadian business leaders, um, and 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 others in our society to rethink some of our basic assumptions about um, public policy, markets, and so on. And that's really, I think, what uh, I spend a, a good deal of my time uh, uh, doing these days. Well, and, and very relevant to what we're seeing today as, uh, you know, the growth in uh, knowledge as, a, as an economic factor. Uh, so we're going to talk about a number of areas that are relevant to this, but I thought I would start by just asking you to talk about globalization. Uh, the people who are watching this uh, may have a sense of what globalization is, but I'm keen that you uh, provide them with a definition of what you understand globalization to mean. It seems to me that globalization in a nutshell involves um, the global exchange of capital, the global exchange of goods and services, the global exchange of people and the global exchange of ideas, uh, which is underpinned primarily by the internet. Um, and, and I think um, you know the, the globalization paradigm has been with us really since the end of the Cold War and the rise of American unipolarity um, and the, the basic operating principle of policymakers in Canada and elsewhere around the world has been to lean in to the liberalization of uh, the people, capital, goods and services uh, and ideas. And uh, the presumption was that that framework uh, would not only um, serve uh, domestic interests in the form of um, export opportunities and jobs and so on, um, but that it would lead to income convergence between countries. Uh, so that is to say, um, uh, the globalization of, uh, of uh, the economy would enable jurisdictions like China, India, and, and others um, to massively increase uh, their standards of living. Um, and, you know, I think what's interesting, Peter, is that that has proven mostly correct. Uh, we've seen tremendous gains around the world as a result of uh, this trend towards globalization. 
Um, but I think it's also created a lot of disruption along the way uh, uh, within uh, advanced countries. Um, you know, the most uh, pointed expression of that disruption, of course, has been the rise of political populism uh, in, in recent years. And I think one of the major questions facing policymakers uh, in the aftermath of the pandemic uh, is what adjustments can we make to globalization that enables us to continue to um, draw on the benefits of, uh, of a globalized economy while minimizing some of the disruption um, that it's caused within advanced economies and advanced societies. And, you know, that's not an easy answer, but I think it's one that will be at the center of domestic politics and policy in advanced economies uh, for the years to come. You've talked about globalization having a lot of benefits, but also uh, mentioned its disruptive nature. Could you talk a little bit more about the benefits and uh, the problems? Um, uh, let, let me, you asked two questions, Peter. First, about the role of natural resources in acting as a sort of bulwark against the type of labor disruption and job polarization that we've witnessed in countries like the United States, the United Kingdom, and elsewhere. And then secondly, uh, you know, if you accept that premise, what does it mean if we can no longer count on natural resources as a major source of employment going forward due to a combination of market forces and policy choices in Canada? Um, let me be as brief as I can in, in responding to those two questions. The, the, the first, with respect to the role of natural resources, think for instance, oil and gas, mining, forestry, and so on. Um, uh, one of the things that's interesting, Peter, is that um, Canada, uh, has experienced a similar level of disruption as the United States and elsewhere with respect to uh, declines in manufacturing employment and other what are oftentimes referred to as mid-skilled jobs. These are often jobs that uh, may not require post-secondary credentials, for instance. Um, but just as Canada has gone through that process of dislocation and industrial change, the natural resource sector has had significant labor demand for those types of workers. And so um, we've in effect had a bit of an insurance policy against the kind of um, job polarization that we've seen elsewhere because of this sustained, this durable demand for mid-skill workers in the natural resource sector. There's considerable research, uh, including work by David Green and Benjamin Sand at UBC that shows that one of the reasons Canada's middle class has performed relatively better than in peer jurisdictions is because we've had this um, demand for um, mid-skilled workers, workers without necessarily post-secondary credentials in the oil and gas sector, in particular natural resources more generally. And the reason I talk about this in some of my uh, scholarship and popular writing is that I think as policymakers grapple with uh, advancing climate change priorities and so on, they just need to be cognizant of this unique role that natural resources played uh, in protecting against um, the type of bifurcation of labor market we've seen elsewhere. Uh, now on your second question, you know, as, as, it, as useful as that has been over the past quarter of a century or so, there is a risk that it's led to a degree of complacency. You know, we've not experienced massive dislocation, and so our policymakers haven't had to think about these issues as much as they've had to in other parts of the world where uh, the consequences of trade and technology on sectors and jobs has been more, um, more stark and more obvious. Um, and, you know, we've seen major job losses in the oil and gas sector over the past several years. There's now um, evidence that um, it's unlikely that we can expect a return um, to the level of demand in the global economy for energy that we've seen in the past uh, few decades. And so, you know, one of the things I think policymakers are going to have to think seriously about, and your students, uh, you know, ought to think about both in your, in your class, but also as they um, graduate and enter the labor market and possibly enter um, uh, positions of business or policy leadership is how do we ensure that we have an economy that isn't just producing 
uh, labor demand for those at the top of the skills distribution um, and those at the bottom of the skills distribution, um, but also has demand for the median worker. I, you know, it's my contention that an economy that doesn't have demand for the median worker is ultimately unsustainable as a political economy, um, um, as, as a, a, from a political economy basis. That that is precisely the conditions that will lead to the type of political disruption that we've observed elsewhere. And so if it's not going to be natural resources that's going to sustain Canada's middle class, um, we're going to have to think creatively about the role of markets, the role of policy, um, the role of education, of course, uh, to ensure um, that those in the middle of the skills distribution have a reasonable expectation of employment and opportunity in the future. Uh, and, and just to clarify, when you talk about the need to uh, sustain the middle class or sustain people in middle income, middle skills, uh, that if they're not sustained, we've clearly got a big division in society. There are some very wealthy and there are some who are very poor uh, and have very poor jobs. Yes. And part, part of the solution, I think, long term, uh, Peter, is to try to pull low skilled jobs in, into mid skilled jobs through a combination of technological adoption, um, professionalization. You know, um, students will, uh, one of the issues that we hear a lot about, for instance, is the role of care work or personal support workers in our economy. So that tends to be characterized as a low skilled job, broadly defined. Um, it tends to um, pay compensation that reflects that interpretation by the market. Um, and so if we're not going to be able to count on manufacturing or the natural resource sector to serve as the, a major source of employment for mid-skilled workers, we're going to have to um, support the creation of new jobs and new industries, um, but also try to pull those occupations that have been characterized in the past as low-skilled into the middle of the skills distribution uh, if we want to have a, a, a thriving uh, middle class in, into the future. Absolutely. And, and perhaps we see some of that uh, in the emphasis on innovation, continuous improvement and that type of thing, where there is a desire to have people who had lower skills in the past play a more proactive uh, role, which would require a higher level of skill. Yes, that's right. Um, you know, but one thing I'd say, uh, Peter, uh, this is something that might surprise some of the students. So um, uh, Canada has a, one of the highest um, post-secondary attainment rates in the advanced world. So um, something like um, something like two thirds of Canadians, uh, working age Canadians, so those between the ages of 25 and 64, have either some form of university, college, or trade certificate credentials. Um, and that is a policy achievement. That's been the result of different levels of government, different political parties supporting greater access to post-secondary education. And no doubt there is more work to be done to better serve uh, some groups that are still underrepresented uh, when it comes to um, post-secondary uh, access. But I think what's striking is that notwithstanding all of that effort, all of those meaningful steps, there's still something like one third of working age Canadians without a post-secondary credential. So that means they either have a high school diploma or less. And that doesn't change all that much uh, across age categories. So even amongst those aged 25 to 34, so people not much older than uh, possibly than your students, the, the share of the population that still doesn't have a post-secondary credential is, is, is just over 30%. So think about this. We have an economy that's increasingly paying high returns to education credentials um, and in turn skills. And we still have this durable, persistent share of the population that um, for whatever reason um, doesn't have post-secondary qualifications and are, are entering a labor market um, that just is uh, not valuing for better or for worse, this isn't a value judgment, it's just a empirical observation, not valuing what they bring to the labor market. And I think, um, you know, obviously we need to be concerned about uh, access to post-secondary 
and making sure that students are getting good education and leaving with minimal levels of student debt and so on. I don't mean to diminish any of those issues, but if I was prime minister or if I was premier, the group in Canadian society I would be most concerned about is the share without post-secondary credentials because I worry a, a great deal that due to a combination of globalization and global comp labor competition and technology, that it's that 30% or so that are going to find it hard um, to find uh, reliable, well-paid employment in an economy um, that I like to say uh, increasingly values um, um, big brains, but not strong backs. Okay, and against that background, what impact do you think that COVID-19 will have as far as globalization is concerned, we've seen some pressures, uh, you know, uh, to uh, reduce the level of globalization, dependence on supply from other countries. And you've talked about something called national developmentalism. So if you could talk about, you know, are we going to see a reversal in globalization? Uh, what do you think is going to happen? I, I think the short answer is yes. I think we're living in a bit of a... Um, it's a bit of a lofty word, but I think we're living in a paradigmatic moment. Um, students might be familiar with the phrase paradigm shift. Um, if you think about it this way, for the past quarter or century or so, our economic paradigm has been tilted towards globalization. What is sometimes described as neoliberalism, you know, basically uh, a economic policy framework that mostly defers to markets to allocate resources, that's, uh, that has a, a visions a limited role for the state in shaping market outcomes, um, and that uh, has made a big bet on what we were talking about earlier, the globalized um, uh, globalization of capital, people, goods and services and ideas. And I think one of the big consequences of COVID-19 uh, will be that policymakers um, start to ask serious questions about um, the efficacy of that paradigm for a couple of reasons. One is it's, I think it's exposed um, uh, the risks associated with um, not maintaining domestic productive capacity in certain key areas. Students will be familiar, of course, with the challenges Canada faced at the beginning of the pandemic. Excuse me, getting our hands on personal protective equipment and masks because we had basically lost all of that domestic capacity um, through a process of globalization. Um, and of course, uh, I think that the pandemic, uh, Peter, has um, exacerbated pre-existing tensions between China and the United States um, that is going to necessarily lead to changes in the way um, globalization is carried out. Students might be familiar with the phrase decoupling, for instance, this idea that um, the United States and um, China, which have been, wh whose economies have been integrated in so many ways through supply chains, you know, um, students would be shocked to discover, for instance, the complexity of the supply chains around iPhones. Um, you know, the, 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 the innovation and the design and development is, is carried out in the United States. Um, the manufacturing is uh, carried out in China, but all of the various inputs that go into that manufacturing process, uh, you know, really do come from all over the world. And I think, um, so uh, in some, I think that, you know, uh, chain, rethinking about the, the risks associated with globalized supply chains on one hand, and a view particularly by the Americans um, that they need to rethink their their um, foreign economic relationship with China is going to lead to um, a new paradigm when it comes to globalization. It doesn't mean that we're, we're going to go back to autarky or uh, an end of global trade, uh, but I do think that there will be countries um, that are prepared to accept um, uh, you know, slightly less globalization in exchange for more resilient, uh, more robust and ultimately more um, domestic uh, productive capacities in these areas um, that are deemed of strategic interest. 
even before uh, COVID-19, we were seeing a rise in opposition to globalization, particularly from populist, uh, you know, uh, uh, as schools of thought, I guess, or movements. Uh, but so the relationship between globalization and populism uh, is something that's been talked about. You've talked about material and cultural reasons for populism. So uh, could you explain those uh, and talk about the relationship between populism and globalization? Yeah, so there's been a, you know, uh, <laughs> after Donald Trump became president of the United States, after, you know, more than 60 million Americans voted for the host of Celebrity Apprentice to be their president, there was a lot of uh, analysis to try to figure out what was going on uh, and what had contributed to this shocking outcome. And um, some scholars, Peter, reached the conclusion that his election was principally a reflection of growing concerns amongst the share of the American population about economic trends. Um, and we've talked about some of those the decline of the manufacturing sector, um, uh, a narrowing of job opportunities for those in the middle of the skill distribution, um, growing uh, inequality, both amongst individuals, but also amongst regions. Um, so for all of these economic reasons, there is a view, uh, there was a view that that's ultimately what read, led to the rise of populism in the United States and elsewhere. There's a, there's a, a competing body of scholarship that says that it wasn't principally economic considerations, it, what gets characterized sometimes is cultural considerations. And those can run from um, uh, everything from uh, um, uh, high rates of immigration and the impact that that is having on um, demographics and, um, and um, the preponderance of kind of cultural norms in a particular society to outright xenophobia and racism. Um, and oftentimes these two schools of thought are are presented as a sort of binary. Uh, you know, that is, do you believe it's economy or culture that's driven populism? And I think students will, you know, kind of implicitly understand that um, that, that binary is a sort of straw man, that these, these forces um, aren't mutually exclusive, but in fact, in a lot of ways, they're, 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 they're linked. Um, you know, uh, uh, a rise in inequality, eco economic inequality, a lack of meaningful mid-skilled employment um, can manifest itself in growing cultural anxiety, um, particularly extents to which there's a perception, fairly or unfairly, um, that, um, that those economic circumstances are being hastened by uh, immigration um, and uh, uh, rising immigration rates. And so, I guess in some, um, you know, for those students interested in the factors that lead to populism, you know, I would encourage them to to review the scholarship and think in their own minds uh, about the relative role of these different um, of these different factors. But on the bigger question about the link between globalization and populism, I, I think I think that there is um, there's certainly something here. Um, you know, if you accept that. Uh, globalization uh, involves trade, it involves immigration, um, it involves um, to a certain degree a, um, a exchange of national sovereignty to either global institutions or even global market forces. Um, you, you know, it is a, a calculated choice on the part of nation states uh, to want to participate in global arrangements and uh, in the name of, um, in, you know, in the name of exports, the name of uh, trade, in the name of um, um, a, a stronger global economy. And I think one, one thing that many of us, um, me included, underestimated um, is the extent to which some within our societies didn't see that those trade-offs were worth it. And to be honest, for some people, they weren't. And um, there's this great quote from a British scholar who says that Brexit uh, was, the, the Brexit referendum uh, represented the revenge of the places that didn't matter. Um, and I, I, I do think that um, many of us who write and think 
and talk about public policy or those who are actually active in the, the world of policy and governance. I, I think we, um, we failed in some ways that we um, became so committed to the kind of theory of globalization that we didn't pay enough attention to the practice. And in particular, um, for those people in places who weren't uh, deriving the benefits of the global exchange of goods, people, capital, and ideas. And I think, you know, in some ways, the rise of populism is our reckoning. So what should be done about it now from a policy uh, perspective? You know, should there be a universal basic income, for example? Uh, that's a, a solution that is uh, advocated by a number of people, particularly from the tech sector, it would seem. Uh, but also, there are other solutions proposed, you know, from a, a, you know, from a Donald Trump perspective, and others from a Bernie Sanders perspective, which are, you know, very different. Uh, and uh, so, what do you think governments should be considering? So, I mean, in a, in a, in a, at the crux of your question is, that, you know, we're going through this transition from an economy of things to an economy of thoughts. And um, that transition will, um, will serve a lot of people well, but it, it'll serve some people in places poorly. And, you know, as we've talked about today, you know, there's an onus on those of us who will be served well by this transition to make sure um, that those who, um, those who, who are poorly served um, have, uh, are able to live and, and work and, um, and have, uh, uh, a sense of, of opportunity and optimism. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think, um, you know, I, I would say there's a couple of things in response. The, the first is, it come, it's sort of a conceptual point, but I think it's crucial. Uh, it's sort of framing. Peter, I think an economy that over time isn't providing opportunity for the median worker is just unsustainable. That is, I mean, I, I really think it creates the conditions for um, a kind of political radicalism that we've not seen before. And, um, and, you know, if I would go so far as to say that over time, if an economy is not creating jobs for the median worker, then the, then the problem isn't, uh, the solution isn't to try to graft onto that economy, redistribution programs and so on. I think it's to reconceptualize the economy itself. Um, you know, I, I think it's as fundamental as that. Um, and that could come in the form of, of, you know, it may need, it may require radical changes around regulation, around, you know, possibly protectionism, if that's what it takes to ensure that uh, the median worker in our society has a reasonable opportunity at, at uh, meaningful employment. I, I, I don't think we're there yet, um, but, but I just think it's, in, I, I think it's important to state that as clearly as I can to students, um, that, I, I, you know, Universal basic income and some of these other proposals, one of their problems with them is that they, in some ways, are an extension of what we've been doing over the past quarter century, which is to let the economy rip and then redistribute the gains from the winners to the losers. And I'm not sure that's, uh, 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 it's a necessary, but I'm not sure it's a sufficient condition to, uh, to, to have the kind of political stability um, that uh, that um, um, you know that we ought to we ought to want, um, and so yes, you know that may be part of the solution. But I think I you know I, I I've become pretty radicalized over the past four years, uh, especially when you get into the data. Can I just give you a couple of quick examples? I'm I'm sorry for rambling. No, go um, ahead. But Statistics Canada um, analyzes um, our labor market according to low skilled, mid skilled. And, um, and high skilled occupations. And they use uh, different methodologies to do that, but they rely on, you know, kind of universal methodologies. So, you know, uh, if students have questions about how they make those judgments, they can, they can review the Statistics Canada analysis. But the point is, it's, um, it's a commonly used analysis to make uh, assumptions about which types of occupations uh, belong in the low, mid, and, and high skilled uh, categories. And what's interesting is, for most of the 20th century, most of our jobs were clustered in around the middle of the skills distribution. And in the past quarter century, what we've seen 
is a, a change in the composition of our labor market. So increasingly, the growth in employment is coming at the low and the high skill, and the relative share of mid-skilled jobs is, is falling. In the province of Ontario, between 1999 and 2019, the share of mid-skilled occupations fell by 10%, or 10 percentage points, rather. Um, nationally, they fell by about five or six percentage points. And so what I've just described is characterized in some of the literature is a U-shaped economy. You think about it, so you have a lot of jobs at the, at the low end, and then fewer jobs at the middle, and then a lot of jobs at the top. And as I said earlier, that kind of economy will serve most of us with post-secondary credentials, maybe post, maybe advanced degrees. We, you know, we're likely to do reasonably well because the economy continues to pay high returns to education and credentials. Um, but remember that 30% or so uh, with high school or less. You know, back in the 20th century, he or she, that person, mostly he, could have gone into manufacturing or in the past 20 years gone into natural resources and had a reasonable shot at it. Um, you know, with less manufacturing employment, less natural resource employment, that person at the middle of the skills distribution has only two ways to go. He or she can try to go up the ladder into a high skilled job or fall backwards into a low skilled job. And, you know, what the data shows is that most mid-skilled workers who are being disrupted are falling, are falling backwards. Um, and, and so I, I don't want to um, sound alarmist, um, you know, but as students who are entering the world of business and policy and technology, I think this question of job polarization and how we can um, support um, mid-skilled employment uh, in our economy is just about the most important political economy issue facing our society. And what you seem to be saying, if I understand you properly, and I'm glad you took longer to explain that, but what you seem to be saying is that solutions that are being considered at the moment aren't enough to deal with the problem that exists. I mean, this uh, uh, the decline of middle income jobs uh, is not going to be dealt with sufficiently by something like universal basic income. What we need are good, well-paying jobs for most people. That that that's my view, Peter. Um, you know, so what the basic income, you know, conceptually, what it means is that we would, for all intents and purposes, accept a U-shaped structure of our labor market. But then the role of policy or the role of government would be to redistribute the gains that are accrue at the top of this of the of the tail and pass them down to those who used to be in the middle or those who are on the low and um, and you know maybe those people who receive a basic income maybe they work a bit maybe they don't um, but they're they have material their, their material needs are cared for through some kind of uh, redistribution model and we could debate you know the right level and how it's delivered and so on the the problem with that approach is I think it underestimates um, the importance that people attach to their productive role, not just their consumption role. Uh, I think a, a society and economy where a large share of the population um, are, um, are, are outside of the labor market um, is a kind of social experiment that I fear could have really, um, um, really um, significant consequences. Um, you know, there, there was important research carried out in the past couple of years um, by a husband and wife research team in the United States. Their last names are Deacon. I'm afraid I can't remember their, 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 their given names. Um, but they coined the phrase, the deaths of despair. And what they did methodologically was they looked at communities and people through the American Rust Belt who had been dislocated. Um, uh, from work due to some of the factors that we've talked about today, mainly technology and trade. And what they discovered, Peter, is that uh, prolonged absence from the labor market was associated with higher rates of family breakdown, substance abuse, suicide, criminality, and other um, uh, social and community consequences um, that were uh, significant uh, for the people in the place affected. And so I guess in a nutshell, what uh, I agree with your characterization that 
I've come to the view that an economy that's not producing enough employment opportunities um, for um, uh, the so-called losers of the knowledge economy is not one that will be sustainable for very long as a kind of political proposition. And so, yes, of course, we need more redistribution, but I I'm just not convinced that that's actually a, a kind of long-term structural solution um, to, the, to, the, to the types of trends and forces that we're witnessing. But that also seems, even to take that a little bit further, that seems to suggest that a simple government decision uh, around, as you've said, redistribution, but even you know, in job creation of some kind or that type of policy is not likely to be also be effective enough. Really, it's got to be uh, something which uh, sees the development of the private sector, uh, of business, and uh, you know the development of the economy in a way that it is doing this. And that goes back to what you were referring to earlier about uh, you know fundamental changes to the economy itself. Yeah, that's right. Um, it, you know, uh, if students are interested, I think just about the most interesting thinker on these subjects these days is is a Harvard economist named Danny Rodrick. Um, uh, who has been making the case for some time um, that uh, what we need is a, a policy framework focused uh, on the goal of good jobs. And, um, and that means that, um, that we'll probably have to accept a level of government intervention in the economy that, ha that has become, um, uh, that has uh, been out, out of um, favor in policy circles for the past quarter century. You know, uh, uh, can I share one kind of apocryphal quote, which I think kind of captures the ethos of policy making in advanced economies in the kind of globalization paradigm. It's attributed to Michael Boskins, who was the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors to George H.W. Bush. So not George W. Bush, his father, who followed Ronald Reagan uh, in the late 1980s as president. And apparently Boskins once said, computer chips, potato chips, what's the difference? And what he was in effect conveying is that whether the American economy produced computer chips or whether it produced potato chips, there was no role for government uh, to make judgments or to try to tilt the scales in one direction or the other. That that was a process of spontaneous market forces occurring in a globalized economy. And I think if students thought about it for a second, they would say, well, of course we'd prefer to make computer chips than potato chips. Um, and the question then is, and should, you know, which is better, it's how do you design a policy framework that creates the conditions for the market to produce computer chips, not potato chips, or at least uh, computer chips and potato chips. And, and so I guess in a nutshell, what, 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 what I think uh, the right conversation needs to be coming out of the, the pandemic is what's the role of government? What's the role of the private sector? How do we design a policy framework that tries to tilt our economy in the direction of producing more mid-skill jobs um, so that we have a more egalitarian labor market as opposed to the U-shaped one, which has really been um, a, um, a, 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 a sustained development over the past quarter century or so. Very, very important, it would seem. And uh, I'm glad we've been able to talk about it. It's, uh, it. It certainly goes to the heart of many of the things that we consider in the course that this is for and, uh, uh, and certainly addresses many of the challenges that we're seeing today. I've got one final question, which uh, is, I think, especially important. I ask it to most of the people I interview. Uh, and it, it's around the advice you would have for students as they embark on their careers. And I think it's especially important today uh, in the interview with you, because we've been talking about a world where there's a lot of disruption, where, you know, the life might not be as good in the future as it was in the past. Uh, I'm not sure that's true, but the, uh, but, but we're, 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 we're talking about a world that's very different from the past. And so your advice to students on how they 
uh, should approach that world would be maybe uh, would be very useful way to end our discussion. Well, so um, I think my principal uh, piece of advice is to um, is to seek out knowledge. Um, you know that 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 acquiring uh, knowledge, engaging new and different ideas, is never a waste of time. You know that there will always be a role for specialization in our economy, in our society. Um, but one of the ways to hedge against some of these disruptions that we we um, we don't fully understand, but we can anticipate are coming in the years and decades to come is to have a kind of generalized um, body of knowledge and, and, and skills that will enable students and workers um, to be able to navigate whatever the economy throws at them. And so, you know, as important, I guess, as, um, as uh, specialization is, I do think sometimes we tend to us underestimate the importance and value of generalists in our society. Um, and, and so I think that would be my, my, my principal piece of advice. Um, you know, take, take your class, but also take philosophy and political science and, and, uh, and uh, biology. And, you know, you really want to, um, um, you know, to, uh, to acquire and develop a, 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 a diverse uh, set of ideas and perspectives. And I would just say, Peter, that you know, from that point of view, we've never lived in a, a a more exciting moment. I mean, I I spend a good part of my days walking my poorly behaved beagle, listening to podcasts on everything from religion and theology to economics and culture and virtually everything in between. Um, and and so I think I would, if I were advising the students, I would recommend that they bet. On um, on being a good generalist, uh, I think that will serve them well um, uh, in in a in an uncertain world. Absolutely, and I think very very good and important advice. Uh, thank you for talking to me today, Sean. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I think it's going to be valuable for the students, and uh, yeah, and and I've enjoyed it too. That's very kind of you. Best to you and the students in this uh, extraordinary time we're living in. But I, I, I enjoyed our conversation very much.